Hello everyone, how are you doing out there? Mm. I tell you what, where I am here today in Oshawa, this afternoon it's kind of a grey overcast, slightly damp, chilly day. It's a good day to have a cup of tea, so feel free to make one for yourself and then settle in for the live stream. I will be here on behalf of the Living Room Community Art Studio from 2pm till 3.30, making art, hanging out, chatting with you, learning about the community and what you're creating. Hello, Nicole! Oh, so good to see some friendly faces here. How are you doing? And you know what? I am looking forward to really learning about how people are doing, what they're working on, where they're at. I don't know if you're feeling the same way, but sometimes, sometimes more than others, but today is one of those days. It's easy to feel a little bit disconnected. I'm so involved in, you know, living room stuff and moving things forward, making this like trying to make the best of the programming we have left this year, connecting with people, getting the word out about different things, various projects, that I realize, wow, I haven't actually spoken to another human being outside my household today. So this is an opportunity for me to catch up with some of you folks if you feel up to it. Uh, and it's an opportunity for you to connect and chat with others in the community if you feel up to it. Hey Wendy, how you doing? And Nicole says, I'm doing well, hope you're having a nice day. It is a nice day. <gasps> Jay! Jay! Hello Jay! Oh, it's so good to see you out there. And again, I'm not actually seeing anybody. All I can see are the comments. So if you want to say hi, I will know you're watching if you say hi in the comments or do whatever in the comments. But if you don't feel like being seen or it's just too much for you to perhaps to, you know, type something in while you're focusing on whatever kind of creativity you have going on, that's okay. You don't need to join the chat if you don't feel up to it. That's totally fine. Uh, emojis are always welcome. I love that big sparkly heart from Jay. Uh, it's just an opportunity if you do feel like you want to reach out and be seen and heard. That's one way that that can happen. Another way is, of course, by sharing images or pictures or links to whatever you're working on in the show and tell post that we do after today's virtual pop-up art hive. So that's usually around 3.45 or 4 p.m. I'll share what uh, whatever I've been working on today and you have an opportunity to share whatever you're working on. It could be works in progress, it could be finished projects, things you're excited about, maybe things that are inspiring you. And if it's something you do want to share in the chat thread here as well, you're welcome to do that as well. I know sometimes people have problems posting images in the chat while we're doing a live, but feel free to post links or names or anything that you want to share or spread the word about just to connect and yeah, get that creativity buzzing again in the community. And as always, Archive safety guidelines apply. We are asking people to be supportive and encouraging of one another. I'll do my best to be supportive and encouraging towards myself as well. And I want you to do the same. Sometimes we're our own worst critics. We're so hard on ourselves. Yeah, I think we can all relate to that a little bit. So if you're having trouble with that, let us know. And we can talk to that inner critic. We can acknowledge its presence, see what it wants. And if it has nothing constructive to say, then we can kick it out. We'll just kick it out. We'll just say bye-bye check in with it later. We know it'll probably still be there, but uh, sometimes it helps to shine a light on it rather than trying to ignore it or pretend that it's not there. So if anyone's having issues with that inner critic, let us know. We have a huge, wonderful community of folks that can relate, that can acknowledge, that can help perhaps even provide you or any of us, all of us with resources to help break away from that negative self-talk for a little while so that we can create and enjoy sharing this space together. And of course the other piece too, I'm accountable. So if I say something that makes you feel weird or strange, or if I do something, anything like that, let me know. I know it's not always easy to do it in the chat, but we work on the premises of nonviolent communication here in Art Hive Land. And I always find that I grow, I become a better human when people have the courage, have the bravery to let me know when I've done something that isn't cool. That's how I learn how to human a little more effectively and I can become more aware of it. Maybe you don't want to do it in the chat. Maybe you want to send me a message or an email. That's okay too. And together, or at least I can reflect on things and identify where those choices are coming from and change them so I can be different next time. Hello, Joanna. Oh, we have lots of lovely company today in the live stream. It's so good to have you here. And what else do I need to mention about Art Hive safety space guidelines things? 
Yeah, I think we work together to negotiate, to find consent, even in the conversations in the thread. So don't be afraid to let people know how what they're saying or doing might be impacting you. Obviously, a lot of the times people don't mean to cause those weird feelings in our, you know, in us. They might even be wanting to not do that. So again, we learn to human together because humaning is a creative endeavor as well. And Joanna's given us an update on what it's like in BC. It's cold and fresh and bright in Cranbrook, BC. Now that is lovely. There's nothing like a fresh, chilly, like a crisp autumn day. That's a really inspiring thing in my world. Gray days like this, kind of damp days, I feel like, oh, I just want a blanket nest and grab a book and a cup of tea and feed my brain and feed my heart and feed my soul. So maybe that's where you're at today too. That's okay. You don't have to create or produce anything in this time if you're not feeling it up, up to it. If all you want to do is listen or watch along while you're doing something else that does help you move forward with your day, that's okay. Could be doing laundry, could be organizing, could just be looking out the window, whatever works for you, right? And Wendy's saying, it's cool and sunny here in Bedford, Nova Scotia from coast to coast. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Joanna's saying, I am baking a chocolate bun cake. Oh, <sighs> that sounds really good. Yeah, I'll have some of that with my cup of tea. If you can just put aside a piece for me. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. And Wendy, it's so, it's so lovely out there in Nova Scotia. Oh, man. I do miss traveling, and I hope one day to get back out there and do a little bit of it in our country because it's such a beautiful, beautiful, like, country. <laughs> It's just, it's lovely. What can I do? Yeah, it is. And we don't really explore it as much as we can sometimes. We like to go to other places and imagine other countries, other exotic places. But when you have a beautiful, beautiful place like this, and maybe we appreciate it a little bit more after the last few years we've been going through. Who knows? Mm. But from coast to coast, let me know what you're working on. If you're having any exciting adventures in art making and creativity, it could be baking, it could be anything. Feel free to share it here. And if you're having any sticky spots with your creativity, you're welcome to share that with us as well. And you never know, there might be someone out there who can help you troubleshoot something. Uh, perhaps there's someone else who can relate. And it's so good to know sometimes that we're not alone in whatever we're going through. Sometimes it's just good to know that we're human and that this, you know, that the difficulties we experience, others experience too. Sometimes it's as simple as that. A nice reminder that we don't have to go through this process alone. So let's see what I got here. I'm just gonna move a few things around. Oh, the sing song is coming back into my voice again. Oh, I've had a couple of days like that where I'm just sort of humming to myself or I start singing my, uh, what is it, my inner monologue out loud. I know something's always going on when I start doing that. It's like I'm trying to figure something out. But let's figure it out with some art, huh? All right, so yesterday, so for those of you who don't know, we've moved. We're kind of shaking up a bit of our online, our virtual programming, and the Thursday night art stream on Facebook, we've kind of moved that over to a Tuesday night. And what we're trying to do is invite people to contribute to what we create or have a direct impact on what what the host is making that night, the themes that are involved. And last night, I happen to host it. Every other week, it's Christine Weird. Some of you might know them from the community, a fantastic artist and just, yeah, awesome, awesome creator. Um, but last night I was hosting and I started this piece and it came from, uh, it emerged out of themes of resiliency, strength, self-advocacy, uh, hey, Sandra, so good to see you. I see Sandra saying hi to everybody. Oh, good to know you're out there. Hope you're having a lovely day wherever you might be as well. Um, yes, it emerged out of interesting themes of self-care, compassion, um, kind of strength building, internal strength building. And the images that kind of came to me as I started working on it in a completely spontaneous way were things like pathways maps, foundations, and I found myself making this little brick pathway through my art. And then, yeah, it kind of also reminded me a little bit like a treasure map or something, but I don't know the treasure that it was leading to. And I wanted as a warm up to start working on this today because I do want to get onto some other stuff that ties into this a little bit. Um, but to warm up, I just wanted to spend some time exploring how to 
bring that path out again because I went off road and I was coloring outside of the lines and it was fun and it was liberating. If you haven't colored outside the lines, I encourage you, I totally invite you to do it. It's super fun, it's scary at first. How strange that something like that can be a little scary. Just, you know, grab a coloring page, whatever kind of coloring materials you might have on hand, or if you don't have a coloring page, create a simple shape or design and instead of filling it in the way, filling it in with color and texture the way you normally might, see what happens if you just purposely break those barriers and push the colors and textures outside of that shape. There's this moment, there's this really interesting moment, at least for me, where I, I kind of had to talk myself down out of this really weird judgmental place of, you can't do that. You do just continue, just stay inside the lines, keep doing what you're doing, don't go off, no. And so then I went off road and it was fun. And it was fun breaking out of that pattern that I had. So yeah, I invite you to do the same. But looking at it today, I want to see what happens if I start highlighting those bricks again, going back to the foundation. And I'm going to start with a black Sharpie because why not? And again, not thinking too much about it because I like the idea of it continuing to be a spontaneous thing. But let's see what happens here. Let's see how I feel when I begin to highlight the path. And I have some white ink on hand too, so that might play a role in whatever I do as well. Maybe over some of the, playing with that black and white, maybe going back to some structure again. But for folks who are joining, thank you so much for spending time with me this afternoon. I realize that not everyone has a whole hour and a half to give to this live stream and that's okay. Watch what you can, do what you like. And if you need to go and work on other things, do life things, feel free. I'm not gonna be offended. Same principle as at the studio. Not everyone could stay the whole day to make art. There was a few hardcore regulars that used to do that in the studio space. But we understand, you've got lives. <laughs> That's why we're here, to be that space that you can touch base with, check in with. Take what you need from, and hopefully leave a little bit stronger, leave a little bit more inspired, leave a little, not necessarily stronger all the time. Maybe what you need from this creative space is an opportunity to feel soft, to feel a little vulnerable, to acknowledge and honor that part of yourself. And that's okay too. You can use this time for whatever you need to use it for. But again, if you'd like to share what you're working on, I always love to hear what people are creating or what people are trying to create or hoping to create. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting, interesting. And I'm without my monitor today, so I can't really see what I'm working on as I'm talking to you folks. I'm glad that you can see it. But if you have any thoughts or suggestions, feel free to let me know. And I can continue incorporating it into this piece. And let's see, Nicole says, one of the things I always found fun at the studio was the found things place. I found the spontaneity of the items sparked a lot of creativity. Yeah, you're right. It was one of those, we had two shelves towards the back of the studio that were always a disaster. <laughs> no matter how hard we tried to keep things tidy. Um, we had things in bins, so it wasn't just like thrown loosely on the shelves, well, for the most part. Uh, but they were bins, like little Tupperware or bins or baskets of everything from costume jewelry to uh, broken bits of toys and like doll parts, things like that. All like a lot of um, kind of seasonal party favors would find their home there, their eventual resting place as potential art supplies. So, you know, you might find after New Year's that we had a whole lot of sparkly hats or little trumpets that you could blow or um, different 
garlands and things like that. And it, again, just so interesting, like Nicole was saying, uh, just so interesting to see what kind of creativity those things brought out. <laughs> and Wendy, uh, <laughs> Wendy's saying yes with you on that. And that's, you know, what Wendy is someone who works with found objects and repurposing things that other people might see as trash or just not as useful or purposeful anymore. I know that Wendy can relate to that. And I imagine you get to a point with your various collections that you need to tidy them up every once in a while. And hello, Momo. Momo saying hello, hello. So nice to see you and hear you and read you all. We are talking about disasters today. Are we? Interesting. Maybe we are. I don't know. There was when we talk about disasters in the space, the studio space, one of the things we talk about is mess. Sometimes it's physical mess, sometimes human mess, because each one of us has, you know, we bring along this emotional and the physical, emotional, and sort of all, all the things going on in our head and our body, we bring that into the space. And sometimes we have to make room for a little bit of a disaster. And art mess, art mess often helped with that. When we're dealing with all this stuff inside, Sometimes we can let it out in the art. And this is something we were talking about last night too, letting the art hold the hard stuff. And <laughs> Nicole saying, I'm, I managed to find a plastic sword there. Yeah, lots of different little quirky things on those uh, those shelves. And Fred, hello, Fredily. Where I'm working on plantable seed cards. That is beautiful. Talk about transformation, talk about Things like that with potential, they become, you're taking one thing, transforming it into another beautiful thing that can then be transformed again. Oh, I'm looking forward to doing some of that myself. That's lovely. What are you going to do with those seed cards? Will they be gifts? Will they be, well, maybe I shouldn't ask. There might be people out there you might be giving them to. I always love doing stuff like that at the studio, seed bombs and things like that. And Momo, <laughs> I guess, yeah, you said disasters, Momo was saying. Yeah, it's interesting that disasters. And I, I use that with humor. I think I use that with a little bit of whimsy and a little bit of lightness. Although there were times and there continue to be times in community for all of us, I imagine, where there's some intense and heavy stuff going on. It's good to have somewhere to put that when you're not quite sure what to do with it when you want a little bit of relief. So letting the art hold the hard stuff, never a bad idea. And Momo was saying, oh, to Fred, yeah, awesome. Tell us more about the plantable seed cards, please. Sounds like a, a potential workshop, I'm thinking. And Jay, yes, you're right, Jay. I'd forgotten about that. Jay uh, saying, we did a workshop for plantable seed paper at the studio a couple of years ago. And you were a part of that, if I remember correctly, Jay. I think, and someone had brought in Yes, I remember. Again, it's funny how workshop ideas grow out of things that happen or things that are given or shared. We had a few big trash-sized bags full of shredded paper that someone had brought in. And I remember one of the things we were thinking, well, what do we do with this? We don't want to just put it in recycling. Is there a way we can use this creatively? And people did find interesting ways of using it to stuff things, to, you know, put into gift baskets, things like that. But then seed paper was one of the things we did. And again, underrated art supplies in the studio are art tools, blenders. Love a good blender. We had a few retired blenders that still worked. And, you know, one of those things that people see on the shelves and they always wonder, what are they, what are they there for? Well, for making things like this. We were able to, you know, mash up the paper and the water and these, you know, these old, really heavy duty kind of out of fashion, but still completely purposeful blenders and make some seed paper. Jay, wow, you're bringing that back, that memory. I remember we had laying them all out like along the fence and along the porch we had out back to help them dry so people could take them home. Ah, memories. <laughs> <laughs> and Nicole saying, I'm doing a never ending line spiral. Oh, interesting. I keep on losing the end of my line though. <laughs> That's okay. It'll be there for you. You can always find it again. And Fred on the seed cards, it's a future studio activity. Haha, -ha, brilliant. And That's interesting. So that's Fred, which, um, if you don't mind me asking which 
studio will it be with? Which art hive will it be with? There's a few amazing art hives out there that I haven't had a chance to go to in person. I've learned about them over the course of the pandemic or heard about them. And you know what? I'd love to do some live stream artist chats with some other folks who are a part of interesting art hives out there in the world, just to learn how they do things, how they hope on doing things, what their plans are coming out of or moving through this very strange time. And Momo following up again, any good how-tos that you wouldn't mind sharing? Interesting, excellent. And Jay's there saying, yes, uh, yeah, you, agreeing you did that workshop. Jay, if you wanna share with Momo any of the workshops you've done, because Jay, you've led a few really awesome how-tos uh, that I hope to do again one day. One of the workshops was, and I, you know, it's one of those that you keep reminding me of what the name of this activity is, and I keep forgetting uh, the negative space drawing where you cover the page with charcoal and then you draw and you create your image by removing the charcoal or the, the chalk from the page. Jay ran that workshop, and then Jay also did a dragon egg workshop that was so much fun with balloons and plaster of Paris mix. And another great workshop that at first you might think is just for little kids, but really all the grown-ups were loving it too. We, I think everyone loves creating forms and shapes and opportunities for imagination. And the metaphors within even that activity, there, you know, they, there's so many places we can go with that. And I'm hoping we can do another one of those workshops, Jay, because we have currently in storage a lovely donation of Plaster of Paris powder mix that came in from, I believe it might have been Drop Dead Candles who donated some of that. And uh, yeah, they're a local candle maker who do such extraordinary, fun, saucy kind of, the kind of sass that I like. Uh, it's empowering and kind of, yeah, just awesome, really. But they also donated that plaster, so we love them. And I hope to make use of it soon. I see some workshop kits, uh, potentially, to share with the community. So interesting. Jay said, so it's all the memories being stirred up here uh, with the seed paper after, that's right, it was after making them for birthday invitations for your daughter. And then Jay said, we burned through two blender motors <laughs> pulping the paper down. They just needed a rest, though. They're fine. They just needed a rest. <laughs> and uh, Fredili is saying you made paper from scratch. Add seeds in the paste. Look for paper making on YouTube. Yeah, I, the paper making is a little easier than you think, and you don't necessarily even need a blender to do it. If you have some time, you can tear up the paper or shred it, get it as fine as you can, and then just let it soak for a longer period to really soften up all those fibers. And then there are different ways you can kind of mash it down to get it paste-like. And just like Freddie was saying, uh, adding the seeds in, you don't need as many as you think as well, but enough so that it covers the paper. I have some screens here, some paper screens that were DIY that uh, just take some old picture frames and some window screen fabric. So if, if anyone out there is replacing their window screens or their screen door screens, save it, uh, give it a rinse, and then you can duct tape it or staple it to the old wooden, like those frames that you have. And you have something that can be used as kind of a down and dirty DIY paper screen. And then you just press that pulp into the screen, smooth it out, letting the water drain away, stack them up to dry, and then you can have your own paper. You can add dyes or pigments to it as well. If you're making seed paper to be planted, well, I suppose it makes sense to do our best to make sure we're not adding anything into that mix that uh, might disrupt the seeds from germinating when it is planted. So sometimes paper, if it's been over bleached or things like that, it can have different chemicals to begin with. So you know what, we make do with what we have and we do our best and we experiment. And through that process, we can learn more and try things out, but it never hurts to give it a go, I think. And Jay catching up and following up. Yes, the charcoal is a lifting technique. That's it, a lifting technique. Why can't I remember that? And the dragon eggs were so much fun, even the broken ones. We made them look like they'd hatched. Yeah, it's awesome. 
and uh, Fred, Fred Dialy saying, for now, it's just a lesson plan with the seed paper, but I'd like to do it with seniors. I think that would be an excellent, excellent workshop with anyone. There's something so tactile about paper making, about the processes, you know, taking something that looks like mush, essentially, and making it as something beautiful and purposeful as well. It's a nice reminder as well of just taking our time and letting things grow over the case over like the course of a few days. I'm not one for patience, as you can tell, but it's such a fabulous reminder because the results are worth waiting for. Nicole saying, I was watching a show recently featuring an, an extraterrestrial, okay, this word I'm having a hard time with today, extraterrestrial lab, even though it was supposed to take place in New Mexico. The gate saw property of the city of Oshawa. <laughs> so shifting gears a little bit, talking about, you know, the filming. We live in a city where a lot of stuff films and they don't always do the best at covering things up. If you live in the place where things are shot, I think anyone knows this. In Montreal, I know this happens too. You can recognize things in a heartbeat and it's always really interesting to see how certain places are portrayed in storytelling. <laughs> That's a good catch though, Nicole. And Momo saying, lovely idea about the paper, the seed paper again, what kind of seeds are better used for that? That's a good question. That's a good question. Fred, do you have any ideas in your, your research so far? I think when we did ours, we used some wild flower seeds, things that we felt were kind of sturdy and tough and could handle a cold germination if you, you know, decided to distribute them outside. But I don't know about that. Yeah, there was no logic behind that choice. It just seemed to make sense to us because wildflowers tend to grow in the places you'd least expect them to. They seem to have a survivor spirit that I really admire. Uh, but I suppose there'd be other seeds that would work really well with that paper process too. I'd love to hear what you folks think out there. If you've tried it out there, yourself and you have your own suggestions, please let us know. And Joe, hello, Joe. <laughs> Joe says, good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well today. It's kind of rainy day, but it's still warm. It is, it's a strangely, it's a nice kind of autumn day. One of those days that, yeah, it's autumn. It's definitely autumn, not too cold today, but uh, as I was saying in the beginning, definitely a cup of tea, read a book kind of day, if you're lucky enough to have that time. And, or to make some art. What am I saying? You can also make some art. Make some art day. And uh, Jay with, yeah, interesting. Yeah, the seeds, a nice reminder about the seeds. So for folks who are watching, and I know some people don't watch this when it's live. Some people tune in after it's been archived or once we've shared it on YouTube. Uh, so this is the good top tip from Jay. Uh, we used all kinds. We used some fruit to help color the paper too. Lovely. That's right. I forgot about that. Natural color coloring is healthier for the seeds. So some had strawberry or raspberry seeds in them. Others, we added sunflowers, wildflower mixes, lavender, anything you like. The sunflower seeds even started to sprout in the paper before planting. That's fascinating. That's wild. I, I I'm trying to think if I ended up taking home any of the seed paper. I don't know if I had a chance to make anything that day. That wasn't an uncommon occurrence. Sometimes we had these fantastic workshops, but I might not have a chance to participate in them, which is one of the reasons why I like being here and making art with folks on Wednesdays. But that's right, I'd forgotten adding fruit into the mixture to color it and give some, you know, just different shades to it. And sensory, just that sensory piece again. I think depending on the size of your paper, again, like just remembering the sunflower seeds, you can make things thicker if you like too. There's so many different ways of doing it. I had on that day, I was just talking about the using the picture frames with the window screen stapled or duct tape it to it. To it. On those days, I think we were using splatter shields uh, from frying. So a really great, uh, I think they worked really well if you're not making a certain shape of paper or you know you're going to cut the paper once it's dried, we used the, the round splatter shields that had the handle. And I think one of the things that uh, worked about that, and 
Jay or other folks who participated on the day, you can let me know and correct me if I'm wrong, was that we could hold it over the bowls so when we pressed out the water, it just went through naturally. And we had the handle so we could lift it off, almost like a, you know lifting off a frying pan with a pancake in it and put it aside. It was easy to flip it, easier to move and manipulate the paper around as it was drying so that we could make more. So you don't need a lot of fancy things to do really interesting projects. It always amazes me, again, like blenders, splatter guards, things that you wouldn't necessarily think of when it comes to making art can be really useful in, uh, in helping us do what we want to do. And Joe says, I have a habit of noticing TTC signs when the show is set elsewhere. That's about, yeah, filming things and recognizing how our cities are represented and when they, I guess that would be a set decorating issue, when they forget to remove signs. Or maybe they just don't have time. There's so much that goes on on a set. They are so incredibly busy. I hope that poor person didn't get into trouble. <laughs> and Nicole saying, I remember seeing seed paper that was meant for butterfly gardens. Yeah, again, you can theme those cards in any way you like, I suppose, with the kinds of seeds you put in them. And you just, it's a little bit of an experiment, a little bit of, I suppose it's another way of looking at creative risk taking, you know, what will grow, what won't. We learn and what works we can take forward. And okay, excellent. So yes, Fred Dieli saying yes, wildflower seeds will go into those and that's lovely. And Sandra saying, I will try to be back. Oh, so maybe taking a break. That's okay. If anyone out there needs to take breaks, please take breaks, take care of yourself. If you need to step away, do what you need to do. That is okay. All right. I'm liking some of this with the uh, the colors shining through. So maybe I'll just highlight some of those. Again, windows into art and I love, it's another way of using that negative space. So this is coming along nicely. I'm enjoying seeing where this is going. But I think I want to move on to the next part of my project today, the next kind of thing I've been warming up into. And that would be playing with some stamps and some silk screen. Oh, I forgot to, I forgot. Again, I've been very forgetful lately. I have some paper bags downstairs that I wanted to stamp and I forgot to bring them up. I'll just have to work on the bags that I have here. And you know what? Maybe I will run and grab some of those paper bags. I'm sure people can, what's the expression? Uh, you can help keep everyone safe while I'm away. Keep the chat going. And let's see, Joanna asking, and I think this is a question to Jay as well. What did you use to lift the charcoal? I am so intrigued. So with that lifting, lifting technique, Jay, if I'm not wrong, I think we use the gummy erasers. So the moldable erasers that um, you can kind of squidge up and erase and then squidge them up again. Uh, they're kind of brown or gray colored. It almost looks like a kind of plasticine. Uh, but those were the erasers that we've used. And although I've used other erasers for lifting technique, and I think Jay, you would agree with this, those gummy erasers are the most effective with this. For some reason, they're just so good at grabbing up and removing uh, whatever's on the surface. And you can use them to take a little bit off or a lot. You just have a lot more control with the gummy erasers. But it can be used to create beautiful, beautiful sort of like whatever you want to create with the lefting technique, or you can also focus on patterns and designs working with that negative space. So I think it's one of those activities that anyone can appreciate. Someone who wants to create a landscape or a portrait of someone, but if you just want to play with shapes and lines, it's a really fun and interesting technique too. And Joe saying, by the way, Nicole and I, oh, 
I separated my thousands of sunflower seeds and also tomato seeds, by the way, you can use a serviette or paper towel as seed paper as they will break down and compost and grow. I've dried this year's tomato and cucumber seeds with those papers. It starts again, the cycle of growth and seed saving and seed storing. It is that time of year, isn't it? Folks, if you're out there and you've started saving your own seeds, let us know what you're working with. I've started with some cherry tomato seeds that I have, some squash seeds, and some pepper seeds as well. And Joe says, they all sell grass seeds and wild wildflower seeds as a roll. And you just roll them up and keep them wet and poof, instant garden. And you're right, I've seen those at the store, but if you can make your own, why not? So Jay saying, yes, Mary, the gray moldable gummy erasers work best. Nice because you can make a sharp edge or a wide, yeah, you can just shape the eraser into whatever kind of tool you need, whether pointed or, yeah, like wider, uh, textured. You can do lots of things with that gummy eraser. I think I've even seen people, maybe not with this specific technique, but use them, uh, like, like press them into patterns so uh, or molds so that you're getting... Uh, an interesting kind of texture or shape in the eraser that you can then use to remove things with. It's not exactly super sharp, but it's something interesting to play with. <laughs> Nicole, in the garden, growing a pumpkin. That's lovely. You got a pumpkin? I never, my pumpkins never seem to get to pumpkin size. I have very small squashes, but they're still wonderful and lovely, and I appreciate them all. And I've said it before, but I will, I will continue to say it. Being able to grow something from seed is just such a wonderful, wonderful thing. It helps me anyways. It helps me appreciate everything that we have, especially what we have in the stores that we might take for granted. After you grow something from scratch yourself, you can never take a farmer's life for granted again when you think about the scale of operations that that involves and how dependent we are on all those little things. It's pretty amazing. But there's nothing like growing your own food if you can. And I know that's a privilege that not all of us have, but even a small windowsill, you can still grow something, just a little something. And Nicole says, yes, it's tiny, but thankfully the animals didn't get to it. Well, we could have a whole live stream about that, couldn't we? the fights we have with nature <laughs> to save to save our produce. This year was a better year for me, I have to admit. I used some, speaking of window screen again, we uh, replaced one of our screens, so I kept it to wrap around the base of some plants just to create a little shield for those seedlings. So every year I discover and I learn new ways of growing things, of taking care of things in my garden. And it's another nice reminder that there's room, I was going to say there's room to grow, but there's no pun intended there. I think as humans, we always, there's more to learn and more to experience. And just because something didn't work out, maybe this relates back to that theme of disasters that I mentioned. There's always something to learn from the mistakes that we make. And in fact, that does remind me of the next project because in the very beginning of the living room, how the living room looks actually emerged from a mistake. So those of you who are familiar with our logo, and I might have, I might have shared this story before, so feel free to tune out if you've heard it before, but our logo for the living room was made from a lino cut that I did where I forgot to, well, to trace the words backwards. I forgot that when you make the stamp or make the imprint that the words you create will reveal themselves in the opposite way. So in the end, after making several prints, because I was just in the zone and I wasn't even noticing that it was coming out backwards. Do I have it here actually? I wonder. I had it on hand not so long ago. Of course. Of course, it's, it's somewhere, but I was making prints, not realizing that the logo was backwards. And then when I saw it, oh yeah, it's, it was one of those disappointing moments. However, when we looked at the plate that I'd carved, the actual lino plate, 
with the marks of the paint and the little nicks and scores from the, the different carving that had happened, it was also quite beautiful. So we ended up using that for our logo and scanning it and finding ways to alter it, to play with it, to reproduce it. And that's where we found our logo. The logo came from a complete, well, yeah, screw up on my end. Something, again, not quite a disaster, but something that could have thrown me into a spiral of like, oh no, what have I done? Turned out to be a really amazing thing and a gift to us in the end. And something that I probably couldn't have tried to do right from the outset. It's almost like I had to discover it that way. It had to happen that way. It had to go wrong before it could go better and become what it was. <laughs> And Joe saying, our pumpkin plant was one seed. The vine probably had taken over my backyard. Yep, they do that. And possibly seven or eight pumpkins that ended up becoming one, about 10 inches in circumference. But at one point, this plant became a horizontal jack and the beanstalk minus jack. Yeah, it's an, squash plants like of that nature. The vines are so enormous, so huge. They're extraordinary, aren't they? And... Oh, lovely Barb saying, hi, Mary, love your picture. Why, thank you. I've been working on recording sounds that I love to listen to in the winter months using the sound recorder on my phone. That is a beautiful art project right there. How many other folks do that? Do you ever go on walks and record little sound, like snippets of sound or little films of things you want to capture and revisit later on? I've done that before. I love that. I love doing that too, Barb, because there are those moments where you'll just need a little bit of summer or a little bit of autumn or to be reminded of something special. And then you already have it and you can revisit it. It's like your own little museum of experiences that you can visit whenever you like. That sounds amazing. Yeah, oh, that's lovely, yeah. And Joe saying, we had hundreds of cherry tomatoes from two plants and green peppers. That's amazing. I got one pepper out of my garden. Carlos! Carlos dropping by to say hi, saying howdy. I hope you're staying safe and well. Mary, this piece is looking beautiful, all swirly and floppy and loopy and super loving it. Splendiferous. <laughs> oh, Carlos, I missed you. It's good to know you're out there. I think there's so many people that are so busy these days. And it's just the nature of this time of year, I think, too. And also the process, the place where we're at with the pandemic. And finding what our normal is now or what the normal will be anyways for us to help us move forward and it's good to know that people are still out there so thank you for saying hi and again if you're out there and you're not quite up to saying hi or perhaps you don't know me and it would be weird for you to say hi that's okay too i'm glad you're there and if this is at all useful or helpful or interesting to folks then I'm happy that we can be here. And Wendy, on the theme of recording or capturing those moments, which reminds me of the live stream artist chat that I had with Drew Lint a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't checked that out, please do. He is a, how does he describe himself? A serial capturist, I think is how he described himself. Uh, Wendy says, I have a recording of a stream that I like to visit when I'm here, which is in Nova Scotia right now, so I can listen to it when I'm back in Ontario. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. I took some pictures of uh, sky, of uh, sunsets and the darkening sky. So I have a series of this one beautiful evening captured in photos that I revisit all the time. I love it so much. And there's something about looking at each moment, like a little, uh, I was going to say motion capture, but it's not motion capture. It could be but it's just frame by frame in my mind of revisiting that night and the kind of calm that that evening brought. So it's, again, the technology that we have allows so many extraordinary things to happen. Lovely, lovely, yeah. And I also have the sounds. I have some lake sounds myself, Wendy. I can relate to that because I'm not near water right now, but whenever I want or need to hear that kind of comforting sound of water meeting the shore. I'll, I'll listen to that. Yeah, lovely. Does anyone else? I'm really curious about that. And Joe saying, 
Oh, wonderful, too. The best part, Joe says, about the recordings that Barb make is that you get to use them as a meditation to help you fall asleep at night. And Joe's saying hello to Carlos and Mama. We all... <laughs> And Joe, I know we were talking about you or your family. We're always normal, just a newer normal. Oh, you're talking about us, of course, because I was talking about the normal that is happening or not happening or that we're trying to find within ourselves when we can't find it outside of ourselves. Yeah, and I, I think that is absolutely true. What is normal? Another question we ask all the time at the studio, and I don't know if there's an answer to that. And Jay saying, I have to go pick up the kids. Ah, oh, I'll check in later tonight. Bye, Jay, and say hi to the kids for us. And Nicole saying, I recorded a few songs from a concert in 2019 that I managed to audio record. They encouraged photos and things. It's comforting to hear the sound of people singing along, and it gives me hope. I love that they gave you permission, that the musicians or the band give you permission to capture that moment. That's, that's a really extraordinary thing to capture those moments collectively. And especially now, to revisit those moments. Lovely, lovely, lovely. All right, folks, I'm going to do something. I did it last night. I'm going to do it again. And this is because I forgot some of my materials. I am going to leave the frame for a moment. And I'm going to run and grab those other things. So if anyone joins in the live stream in the next couple of minutes and says, what's going on here? Where's Mary? What's happening? Can you let them know? Can you let them know that I've just ducked out of frame for a little bit? If I had some uh, music to put on in the background, like a little kind of elevator music to fill in the time, I would. But I think I'm just going to be super quick. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that right now. Yep, because next I want to do some of this. Okay, I'll be back. <gasps> I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. Almost back, almost back, almost back. Hi, I'm back. Again, that felt liberating. Normally I would never do that. I'd be too scared. I'd be like, no, I have to stay with the stream. Like the time I forgot my power cord on the laptop and it died in the middle of a stream. I don't know, this is a new Mary maybe. Maybe this is part of my new normal, just embracing everything, coloring outside of the lines, running away from the camera mid live stream. And let's grab that too. <sighs> that was fun. <laughs> and Joe's saying, by the way, when I was driving through Toronto today, I saw a restaurant called the Unicorn Cafe with a life-sized unicorn out front. <laughs> that sounds amazing. What a moment. And I'm look forward, looking forward to the poem you might write on it, Joe. And Joe has to go too. He says, be safe all. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, Joe. Thanks for being out there. And be safe. Be safe, okay? Take care of yourself. And, oh, Wendy, give it... Oh, thank you, Wendy, for the encouragement. I did it. I ran and got it. And I'm going to start with a stamp. So, in that piece I was working on before, there was something that I, I was thinking about last night and mentioning. There was a sense of repetition and pattern and breaking free from the pattern. Those seem to be big themes in my day-to-day -day as well. What happens when we want to reorganize things, reorganize our brains and give ourselves, provide new opportunities for ourselves. So I want to revisit some of that comfort that comes. Now I've colored outside the lines a little bit and played with that, shaken up some of my patterns and routines. I would like to get back to structure and just do kind of some housekeeping work for the living room. But it still involves a little bit of creative risk. I'm going to be uh, stamping some pieces and then silk screening some pieces. And again, well, I think we have enough time to do this, so why not? We were really, really lucky many years ago in our first year or two of having the studio open. There was, uh, it was Andres Musta actually who hosted a lino cut workshop that we did there. And invited some fabulous guests from the community and everyone made their own stamps. Oh yeah, I think that might be a bit gummy. 
and one of the artists there created the stamp for us, which was one of the best gifts we could have ever received. Oh, Nicole asking, what is silk screening? Well, here I can show you briefly. It's this! So what I will be silk screening today, see this, the reason they call it a silk screen is because there's a frame and then there's a very, very, very fine mesh screen that's overlaid. So as opposed to the ones we were talking about that we used when we were making seed paper or making our own paper from uh, pulp, these are a very, very fine fabric and you block out certain parts of this fabric. And once it's dry, what you do is you can put paint on top of this and you kind of smooth it over and push it through this very fine mesh. And that's how uh, people get designs on t-shirts a lot of the times or you know different printing techniques. It's a kind of printing that you do, silk screen printing. And you can get, you can do this and like block it out yourself with a kind of screener that allows you to create your own patterns with painting. You can do what we did for this one, which I think was burn an image into the screen, which I don't know if I understand all of the ins and outs of that. That might be for another live stream to, so I can give myself a refresher on how exactly we did that because it was a bit of a process. But we, what you do end up creating, if you're lucky enough, is something that's really fine and you can even do photographs this way. And so you can silk screen images that are really detailed and quite um, realistic onto things. Today, this was a screen we made a long time saying, today I will create, and then you could fill in the blank, what you were going to create with the living room logo below. I don't need this part of the screen. I just want this part of the screen with the living room's logo. I'd like to silk screen it on all those bags that I'd shown you before. Since we're getting ready to get the mobile art hive out there on the road to start distributing kits and uh, just sharing the resources that we have and perhaps even like for having some pay which you can kits on hand too for folks. So that in a nutshell is what silk screening is. I know it's not the best uh, explanation in the world, but hopefully it's enough of an explanation to help you get the idea. Now, of course, along with silk screening, there are so many other different uh, ways of transferring images onto things. And I'm using a combination here of acrylic and fabric paint. This is what I would do with stickers. I would use fabric paint to do something that people normally might use acrylic paint on. And it was Andres who taught me that trick because fabric paint has a little more give in what you're doing. So if you're making stickers or things that are flexible where you don't want the image to crack or flake off, then if you use some fabric paint with that, it has a little more flexibility. It takes longer to dry, but a little more flexibility. And Nicole's saying just about the silk screening, that's so cool. I remember carving my own stamp in art class in high school. I made a penguin. <laughs> oh, it wasn't very pretty. Hello, inner critic. It wasn't very pretty, but it was a real experience. And that is true. Oh, Carlos says that's awesome and was a great explanation. Thanks for that. Well, oh, thank you. I will uh, let my inner critic know. Go easy. Come on, Mary. Come on, Cronert. I haven't done this in forever, so I will be rediscovering this process as we go as well. But just whipping up a little bit of paint at the studio. I remember Andres would just use the tables to do this on because he could clean them up afterwards. I have a piece of glass that I'm using here just to help a little bit with the mess so I can transport this a little easier to clean up afterwards. And you know what I'm gonna get? Okay, here we go. Haven't done this in such a long time. It's one of those things that you, if you have the supplies on hand, sometimes you can talk yourself out of doing because it seems like it's so much work and there's so much to set up, but really there's not. So ideally you want to give yourself a nice coat on the stamp. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, here we are. So this is, oh, you know what's really lovely about this? 
I flipped it over and on his head help that day from some artists that came in, I think from Toronto. And what I'm noticing now is on the back of the stamp, I didn't see this then and I'm only seeing it now. They said, thanks for everything. And it's from Euro Mask or MSK at PUA69. Isn't that great? Rediscovering beautiful gifts and the artists who've created them for us. That's lovely. <sighs> in Art Hive land, we've got such an excellent community of people. And there we go. One paper bag down. And now I will begin the process of layering things all over my studio space to let them dry. All right, you go there. And I wonder if I could use this. I wonder what the difference would be with the silk screen and the stamps on the bags. I might do a little test of that as well. But first let's go through a few more paper bags. And I remember this getting inspired to do this um, after a visit to Le Milieu in Montreal, actually. There was an opportunity to... I don't know if this silks, if the workshop, the stamp workshop was that weekend, it might not have been, but they'd had an artist come in or someone come in who was helping them uh, stamp business cards. And they created these lovely little stamped business cards just with the name of their art hive on fabric. And it was repurposed fabric scraps. And I thought that is brilliant. And I might steal that in the future. Shout out to Le Milieu and whoever that artist was who helped them with that or volunteer perhaps. But business cards, who says they have to be on paper, right? And of course, we've also talked with fantastic artists. Oh, so that one could use a little bit more. But this is also a different kind of paper. So it's interesting to see how different papers respond to the stamp we have here too. What was I saying? Yes, uh, Rian Press, who was an artist that we've talked to, an Ottawa-based artist. They make stamps. They carve stamps for part of their living as an artist. And I think Wendy had one made by them. And it just looks amazing. So I might have a stamp made for the Mobile Art Hive by them. I might commission something as well. Or maybe try making it myself. Who knows? And Nicole's saying, I accidentally made an artistic discovery yesterday. For some reason, I ended up with a white marker with my whiteboard. I tried to use it, but it just erased the residue from the markers that hadn't quite wiped off. It was like an accidental magic marker. Top tip. So was it an erasable marker or just a white marker? White markers are interesting. That's assuming that we create art on white paper. Of course. There are different art techniques out there about again, removing or lifting off pigments or what have you. And that's one of the way, if anyone's ever experienced it before when you're painting something that isn't quite dry and you go over with a second coat, how it lifts off the first. And Wendy saying, yes, Noah did two for me. They arrived while, I, oh, they arrived while you were in Nova Scotia. Cannot wait to try them. That's super exciting. And Nicole says, I think it was a processing error. Interesting, in the white marker, perhaps just one that never got ink. Interesting, loving that technique, loving that color. So these bags, it would be great to have everything stamped. It would be amazing. I don't want, I can't ask myself or expect myself to print off hundreds and hundreds of bags, but in moments like this, it's really quite relaxing to do. There's something really satisfying and settling about the repetition of it and also revisiting that moment in time from the studio. So I'm going to add some more yellow into this piece here. There's 
something really satisfying about spending time rolling out the paint. Of course, if any of you know Andres, you know you may also know Andres a zombie art squad. He makes all his stickers this way. And he uses vinyl offcuts from printers. So that's another excellent resource. If you have a printer near you, I always check in to see if they have any vinyl sticker offcuts. Something we don't think about all the time. how different businesses can turn to and rely on one another. Let's see. Maybe just a few more of these and then I'm going to move on and practice with the silk screen. And if anything, this will help me warm up into this process because if I don't make time to do these little things, I sometimes just don't get done. And there's something really satisfying about taking care of. This feels like housework. It feels a little bit like, yeah, work for the living room. And it's a nice break because anyone who works at an art hive or assists with that like community programming through an art hive you go through moments, don't you, where you feel, especially I think during the virtual moments, as Momo was saying, we're looking for things that we can share with people. We're looking for new ideas or workshops, but sometimes it's the simple things that can engage us the most and bring us together. And that's one of the things I miss from the space, the physical space of inviting people to be a part of the process of taking care of the art hive. <laughs> and we've had so much help in so many ways and so much assistance in so many ways from so many amazing people in the community. I look forward to hopefully soon, hopefully very soon, being in a place where we can get together with people and actually hunker down together to get some work done. And the great traditions of everything from quilting bees to sewing circles. And I think that's Nicole asking me, <laughs> as I was, before I ran away, uh, you mentioned elevator music before you left the frame. If you could choose a song to play in an elevator, what would it be? <sighs> That's a good question. There is a song by the stars or stars. I think they might be called called elevator elevator love. I think it might be called it's quite a lovely song. Maybe that would be the song I'd play in an elevator. I know it's on the nose. But why not? Why, Nicole, what song would you choose to play in an elevator? All right. Let's try the silk screen, folks. Let's do it. Oh, and Momo says, <laughs> for me, it would be Alan Gogol, Otter Rain. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Momo. I never get tired of that one. So soothing. So that would be your elevator song. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Now I have here a little damp cloth, so I'm just going to wipe this down. I'll give it a really good wash after the live, live stream, but just to kind of clean it up a little bit. I made sure to have lots of damp rags on hand today. That's a song I need to find. And Nikki, lovely. Strange that you are talking about taking care of things at the studio. Hello, Nikki. I still remember washing up the cups and stuff in the back and thinking, this feels so right. Just like I was part of it 
a bigger family. Yeah, those are the moments, some of the moments we miss the most, I think. Just that opportunity to be a part of something, to contribute to something. Even in things that aren't necessarily arts-based, there is that sense of taking care of something. And I think that's intentional with Art Hive work, isn't it? It's the idea of being of service whenever we can. And being of service can look like a lot of different things. And not everyone who comes to an art hive wants to create art all the time. So sometimes there are ways to still contribute and feel creative that just have to do with simple little things like organizing or washing mugs, welcoming people, being curious about what other people are making. And that's definitely intentionally at least as I understand it, part of that process. Because art hives should be, should, I don't like using words like should, but there is a sense of when something is for the community, there is a desire for everyone to be a part of that. There's a desire for people to give back, to contribute, to help move that forward. And I think that's what makes it different than a lot of other services or programs that are out there. Things where we're kind of building expectations around the customer service model, right? I do this for you, I make you happy doing this, or I don't make you happy doing this. It's my job to do this for you. Um, I think that's one thing I love about the Art Hive model, that it's really a reciprocal process where you meet people where they're at and given on any given day, we might not be able to do the thing that we did yesterday, but we can try and there is a way to contribute for everyone. So same with financial support too. There's a way, you know, one day you might be able to throw a toonie in the donation jar. Maybe the next day you can't do that, but yeah, you can wash some mugs at the end of the day, or maybe you baked some cookies and you'll bring those in for folks. There's just different ways of sharing and creating, co-creating that environment of comfort and accountability and creativity. All of those pieces fit together and sometimes, maybe sometimes they don't fit together, but then you can work again. There's another opportunity to address it and work together to mend things, to reshape the project so it can hold and provide whatever it needs to all the people who are a part of it. It's That's why I refer to the living room a lot of the times like it's its own work of art. I think art hives are works of art. They're not things, they're not services, they're not even programs, they are works of art. And that's a hard thing for people to understand. It's a hard thing for me to understand. I don't even understand it. Alrighty, so let's start with this. Now I've got this here. You know what, where did I throw that rag? I'm gonna wipe it down. And Nicole on the answer of what Nicole would play in an elevator. I think it would be interesting to just play really catchy songs so people would sing along. <laughs> Nicole, that sounds a little bit like an arts project. It sounds, the question would be, what would happen if, what if we played really sing-song songs for folks? Something that everyone, I mean, it's hard to know what people want to sing along to but that would be a really interesting creative experiment to see what do people sing along to in the elevator? Do they sing along to ABBA? Do they sing along? I'm just gonna wipe, oh no, you know what I'm gonna do here? I don't wanna waste this, so maybe I'll do this. I'll do an imprint. Is there something, one song that everyone sings along to? I feel like there's potential there. That's a project. A little mono printing going on. And now I think I'll wipe some of that off so I can start with some new colors. There we go. Move that back over there. Put my spoon back over there. Yeah. Again, we started at the very beginning of this. We started with the conversation, the, the idea of um, when Nicole bringing up the found object shelves and how sometimes they could turn into a disaster or as Margaret would say, a crapalanche. There was always a crapalanche going on somewhere in the studio. 
Um, and a crapalanche is when things, art supplies, just fall off a shelf. And you may not know why, maybe you pick the piece of paper from the bottom of the pile and all the other papers fall off. Margaret always came up with the best terms and descriptors for things, and crapalanche was one of those terms. <laughs> But along with those disasters was also people coming together to address those disasters and tend to one another if we were, I don't mean physically hurt, but if we were affected by those disasters. Some days it was emotional disasters if someone was having a bad day. Now, I'm pretty sure this won't bleed through. Will I have enough space on the counter? But that creative care occurred in so many ways. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for a piece of... You know what I'm going to... I'm going to put in a paper bag. So sometimes with silk screen you want to put in a layer in between what you're silk screening. Just to make sure that the colors of the paints don't bleed through. In this case I'm going to do it to provide it with a little bit of bulk. So that I can... Yeah, that'll work. So Nikki, you've got me thinking about that. What happens, how we take care of one another, how we tend to one another. Hmm. I think I want purple. How we help one another recover from those strange experiences, whether they're disasters or not. Oh, and back to elevator music for Joanna. It's Happy by Pharrell Williams. That would be good elevator music. It'd be interesting to see how people danced along to those things. What do we do when we think no one's watching? Let's see. I'm using some old fabric paint here, so it might be a little bit gloopy. That'll be another interesting experiment. Let's see. Will pink go well in this? Maybe it will. I'm going to try it. But before I do that, I'm going to cover over that little line because I don't think... Just in case paint catches it, I don't want it to go through. And then I can use that line. Here we go. Let's see what happens. Oh, I need a squidgy thing. Where's my squidgy thing? As she desperately searches off camera for the squidgy thing. Squidgy things can look like a lot of different things. Oh, Nikki says this looks interesting. I've never done it. Uh, silk screen printing is not as tricky as, as uh, people think it is. And there are lots of fancy tools. The most essential tool is, of course, the screen. I've also used... Uh, this is what I'm going to do. I have some little stars here. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> you can buy all the proper tools to use with it. But sometimes you can improvise. I'm going to improvise here. Now, I don't have my squidgy thing. There is a technical term for that. Can't remember what it is. It's like a little bar, a little sort of rubber screen, like uh, with an edge to it that you would drag across the paint to push it through, just to help mash it through the mesh. I've also used old gift cards as my squidgy thing. Today I'm going to see how this works, a piece of like plastic, like a little stiff piece of plastic. I think the key is you want something that will help keep the paint close to the screen and help it go through. Now screen printers everywhere, are probably screaming right now as they watch me do this. And I won't necessarily get the exact effect that I'm hoping for, but we'll see. Just need to apply enough pressure that we can help do this. Now, again, because I'm doing a really sloppy job, the screen printer would draw it through first. So, just to see. So there you go. So you lift up the screen a little bit, just to flood the screen. And now comes the time of drawing it across. Now, granted, 
it would be better if I had a stiffer squidgy thing. And then you can uh, assure even distribution. So I'm going to see, do I have another squidgy thing around here? I wonder if cardstock would work. There we go. Now cardstock won't be as good to, as far as repurposing the paint, but let's see. Fingers crossed, this could be a disaster. Wouldn't be the first time. It's a bit of an experiment as always. Oh yeah, so not so bad. So there you go, the first try. Not so bad. And a little crooked, of course. What else would it be? It would have to be a little bit crooked. But definitely a proper squidgy tool would be an asset at this stage. Where are my squidgy tools? All right. So put that one aside and move on to the next. What do I have here? Ah, some pastel. So maybe what I'll do, make this one a little bit more purple. And of course, this is always the, the fun, troubly little bits of doing this in a live stream in a small space not quite having enough room. Let's move over this squidgy bit and see if we can find another. Squidgy bit, where are you? I know you were here before. I'm feeling quite silly right now. Oh, Nicole saying, Nikki saying very cool. I'm glad it looks very cool. Sometimes, you know, the paint does what it wants to do. So let's try it again. And this time, let's see if I can add some purple into it. So let's see what I got here. What if, what happens if? And I might use, mix a little bit of color here on the side to get something a little more purpley. You can buy silkscreen kits at a lot of places. They're... Hmm. That's very, let's see, will that color work? Yeah, it might. Of course, my silliness, screen printing without a squidgy thing. This is living room, Mary living room, live stream art making at its best <laughs> or worst, depending on the way you look at it. I do love playing with things and experimenting and yeah, a surprise each time, Nikki, that's exactly it. I think there's something in me personally that is drawn to just experimenting and seeing what happens if you just give something a go, if you let go of the idea of perfection. And you can't do that everywhere in ordinary daily life. Squidgy thing, where are you? It's not coming to me, I don't know. Calling to an inan inanimate object is not doing it. So I'm gonna keep on using this card. But it's one of those things we encourage people to do, so I think it's it's okay to model that as well, to see what happens if. This reminds me of one of our fundraisers where we silk screened hundreds of hand sewn bags that we gave we gave out to all the people who attended. Another fascinating day that we had at the studio. And Barb saying, love this, I've never seen it before either. Well, I would recommend definitely looking online for some other tutorials if you want to learn how to do it properly. For example, with a proper squidgy thing, we might not get those 
those block things, those missing bits in the paint, because there'd be a proper pressure applied to get the paint through. But I think for the purposes of today, it's okay. And I like things that aren't perfect. That's <laughs> big surprise. I love seeing the person's, the creator's hand in a project, like seeing a thumbprint on a sculpture or a brush mark or a cat hair in the painting. Ooh, come back here. I like being able to see the human in whatever art has been made. And you can definitely see that in anything the living room makes. Let's see, let's find another one that would work well with purple. And then I might begin washing up. Oh, maybe that one. Let's see. Let's lay this down for a moment so I can grab this. Hmm. I have all these hand sewn bags. It's fun to see all the different patterns that we have from the scraps. And Nikki was saying, Nikki says, I, how did your trip to the student association at the college go? That's right. Oh, Nikki. So, and perhaps this is a good place to wrap up today as well. So for folks who've been keeping an eye on our mobile art hive project, the vehicle is now back with us. It has been converted. And when we say converted, what we mean there is it's had the mechanical, all the adjustments made, it's drivable, it's ready to be filled with art supplies and decorated and customized, personalized to what we'd like it to look like. Uh, but we got it back so, so soon, just last week. And the first event that we had that we were hoping to get the, the vehicle, the mobile art hive out to was at Durham College for the student association. It was a collaboration with Danny Crosby's Fine Arts uh, Community Collaboration class. So they had created all of these wonderful workshop kits for us and for students, fellow students, with materials, like simple materials that we had a lot of on hand. So lovely, and lovely things even like coloring pages, things like that. And Although the bus was still brand new and we hadn't fully stocked it yet, it was mostly empty, we decided to take it out on the road and kind of pilot it out to see what it was like to set it up and get it out in there in community. So in short, Nikki, it went very well and it was very promising and I'm super excited to see what happens the next time we have it out. So keep an eye out, folks. We will be getting out there in the community in the upcoming weeks. The next phase of the project specifically is to organize it, to feel comfortable inside of it, to maybe personalize it a little bit more. That day gave us a real good opportunity to learn what it was like to move around inside of it. Are things like, where do we naturally tend to go when we're looking for something? How do we move? Are there in trouble spots inside the vehicle? What is it like moving around outside the mobile art hive? How do people come and gather? How do people connect through it? Because it's a completely new, way of engaging for us. We're used to having that storefront that people come into and sit down at and there's just, it's just more traditional. It's easier to understand what's expected of everyone in that situation. But with the mobile art hive, what we're moving into is really research and exploration about placemaking and what happens when you don't have four walls for your studio. What happens when you have to, it's just a different way of interacting and how do you provide that safety and comfort for people? How do you introduce concepts of things like radical hospitality to people who may be more familiar or might just be passing by? Um, I think of the NDG Hive projects in Montreal that take place in parks and things like that. I think those would probably be good resources for us at this time to check in with them. Um, yeah, to learn a little bit more. So new, experimenting with a new squidgy thing, styrofoam tray. Hopefully that gives us enough pressure to push the paint through this screen. Here we go. Now, if your ears are sensitive to styrofoamy stuff like mine, you might wanna put your fingers in them or cover them up for a little bit. All right, here goes. Ah, 
Ah, much better though. So in a pinch, if you don't have a gift card or an old bank card <laughs> laying, laying around and you don't have the original squidgy thing, looks like a styrofoam uh, tray might work just as well, but the proof will be when we lift it up. Oh, and in that case, maybe I didn't have enough paint on it. Oh, my, I'm a little disappointed in that one, but you know what? It's still there. It's still usable. The idea is, is it part of that process? And for bags that we might be giving out to people or asking for pay what you can donations for, maybe this one, uh, maybe this one we'll give out for free because it just not, didn't work out exactly in the way I was hoping to. But that's part of the process, experimenting, exploring, learning more about how to create the things we want to create when we may not have all the supplies on hand. So that one worked out nicely. Let's see, what else do we have here? Where did that other one go? This one as well with that red. I really do like that too. It's all a part of the process, a part of experimenting. So not so bad. It's a learning process, could be better, and it will be better. But for now, I think that's a great starting point. It's a good leaping off point. I've got stuck in and I can continue to work on it now that I have all the materials here. So keep an eye out when we do get the mobile art hive out there, we will have lovely uh, little bags for folks who are taking some of the workshop kits home. And who knows, it might become a way of supporting the studio and helping us do what we do. So I'll get on top of that. But for now, I think it might be time to wrap things up here. Oh, folks, thank you so much for joining us. What an interesting afternoon. Up, down, and all around. But some fantastic conversations and checking in with people about really interesting things, sharing resources and workshop ideas as we connected and created here today. Thank you for being out there. And I'm so, Nikki, you're right. I'm happy for the students. I'm happy that we can, we're almost at a point where we can be back out in the community again and exploring and discovering what community connection and engagement looks like now. Things have changed so much and there's still so much we need to do to take care of ourselves. I think we do ourselves a disservice if we try to pretend like we're just going back to the way things were. And because in that, there's also opportunities for new things. Every time that a mistake is made, every time something doesn't work out the way we want it to, every time we're surprised by something that could very well be a disaster, whether it's an art disaster or a real life one, there's opportunities for growth within that. Things that we can learn, learn from and move forward with that might help us live the lives we really want to live. I don't want to miss out on any of those opportunities. I will. Of course I will. I will do things imperfectly. I will continue to mess up and not put my paint on and lose my squidgy thing. But I also hope that I will continue to create. I won't let that get in my way because for those moments where wonderful things happen as a result, where those mistakes become fabulous discoveries, those are the things that really make life interesting. And ah, yes, Nikki, as you say, mistakes are just opportunities to learn. <laughs> yeah. They suck sometimes. They absolutely suck sometimes. But yeah, we can find ways of making meaning of them and turning them around. And there are some mistakes in my life that I wouldn't take back even if I could, right? They've created wonderful things because I didn't know what I didn't know. And again, art is a wonderful way to work through some of those things and discover things safely and manageably, sometimes messily but you can still explore it. And at the end of the day, clean up, tidy up, put it away and take those new insights with you as you go forward. Anyways, folks, thank you so much for being here. It's great to make art with you again, as always. I'm looking forward to being back here next Wednesday for another Facebook live stream and might see you, might see you in other Zooms and things like that and Instagram live streams before that. But until we can connect and create with one another in person, I do look forward to connecting and creating with you right here online. Be sure for you writers out there tomorrow morning, uh, we have a Zoom with Danielle D. It's a creative writing workshop Zoom. 
If you're interested in exploring that side of your creativity, be sure to join her. I'll share the link again later on today and tomorrow first thing before the group. But again, for tonight, take care, stay safe, keep creating, and keep on believing in yourself. Your voice does matter. Have a good one, folks. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.